What is artistic authenticity? The question of authenticity is important to me. By that I mean, does an artist, a writer or a composer, genuinely have something of importance to say, or do they merely hide their inadequacy and ineptitude behind an avant-garde veneer? If an august body commissioned Stockhausen, or certain other champions of the avant-garde I could name, Maurizio Kagel, Vinko Globacar, and Dieter Schnabel come to mind, to compose a bassoon concerto in B-flat for a local school, say. Well, he simply couldn't do it. Hans Werner Hens said in an interview, if someone paid him to write a symphony in G major for a social purpose, he'd do it, because a creative artist does not, and I insist cannot, exist in isolation from his peers and the society in which he or she lives. You see, I ask myself, what is the role of a composer? Perhaps I could also ask, what is the role of a pop group? It is necessary for me to ask these questions because at two periods in our career, we ventured into avant-garde territory and the majority of the more arcane, esoteric works were composed by me. Works hardly anybody wants to hear again. You'll find most of this material on phases 2, 3 and 6 of the Rock in Opposition albums and our grotesque collocation of chaos, otherwise known as civil disobedience, if you're curious. Of these, Rio 2 is flawed but acceptable, while Rio 3 and civil disobedience are best forgotten. Only Rio 6 stands the test of time. My relationship with the avant-garde is definitely equivocal. The respective members of Throbbing Gristle, for example never pretended to be expert musicians, not even Genesis Pissoffrage. They never utilized their avant-garde idiom to disguise technical ineptitude, an accusation I level at most other exponents of the avant-garde in pop music and, to a lesser but equally important degree, in the classical retinue. My question to any exponent of an avant-garde idiom is this. For whom do you create your films, art, literature or music? We should have asked ourselves that question when we commenced work on Rock in Opposition Phase 3, easily our least popular project. As an exercise in sheer self-indulgence, it is a major success. To date, only one person has ever contacted us to tell us they really enjoyed the CD, a young chap from Cambridge who suffered from motor neuron disease. For that reason alone, I can be satisfied the project does not constitute a complete waste of time, effort and finances, but really, it raises a very difficult question I still can't answer. The same question faced by Cornelius Cardu and Luigi Nono. Both those composers adopted forms of communism in their political beliefs, yet both were initially exponents of the extreme avant-garde in their music. Our series of projects under the Rock in Opposition banner generally focus upon intensely political works. I think they are possibly the nearest I have ever come to the expression of libertarian, even what you might erroneously call left-wing politics. Thus, we have a distinct problem. If a film, artwork, novel or musical piece has a political message to proliferate, then it must be able to communicate with the mass of ordinary people. Is any work in an avant-garde idiom liable to do that? Of course not. How many factory workers on assembly lines in Essex or Bradford ever listen to Cardio or Nono? <laughs> or Unit, for that matter. Therefore, what is a genuinely creative artist supposed to do? How does he or she resolve the problem? Cardu decided to adopt an ersatz 19th century romantic idiom, just like the musicians in China in the 1960s, and churn out puerile pap coupled with atrocious texts. There is only one lie, there is only one truth, is a notorious example, a thoroughly daft revolutionary communist party tract, clumsily squeezed into this dreary hymn tune that is actually hilarious. Cardew was technically a superb musician and composer, but he allowed mere politics to inhibit his creativity and thus become little more than a figure of fun. I wrote a critical essay on his life and work for one of the issues of Smile magazine in the 1990s. 
He thought he might be able to reach the mass of ordinary people with his new style, but such a notion is ludicrous, of course. The mass of ordinary people are simply not interested in what they consider highbrow music, or if they do allow a few works to sit alongside their pop albums and film soundtracks, then it is invariably the familiar tedium of Tchaikovsky, probably Swan Lake, The Nutcracker, or one of those greatest hits compilations that feature short excerpts from longer works, the notion being that most people don't have sufficient attention spans to listen to a whole concerto or symphony or any of the other names we see time and again, Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, Beethoven, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, all the famous tunes plus a few arias and choruses from operas by Verdi and Puccini. So, if a composer has a political message to impart, then they need to sound like that. Do they? Well, in theory, perhaps, but how many people would even notice the message unless it was actually spoken by a reciter? It is possible to listen to, say, the Cantata for the October Revolution by Sergei Prokofiev and ignore the text, simply treat it as an intensely dramatic and exciting work for choir, wind band and orchestra. People wallow in the orgiastic melange created by Wagner and Strauss. Blissfully ignorant, it constitutes a soundtrack of absolute hate toward Jewish people. No, no, adopted a different tactic. He softened his sound palette such that after the early 1970s, virtually all his music is extremely quiet, extremely slow, and extremely boring. So even fewer people listen to it than previously. The mass of working class people ignored his avant-garde political poster works of the two previous decades, but at least the elite intelligentsia and certain students appreciated his music. After the 1970s, even they ceased to have any interest in it. Thus, both Cardew and Nono failed. Now, did we achieve any level of success by comparison? Yes, we did, but then our task was far easier. We already had a regular audience willing to tolerate our occasional ventures into avant-gardening because they knew it would never be long before another brace of bright and breezy pop songs appeared over the horizon. Excuse my cynicism. I don't like cynicism in general, but when I consider the present state of the nation, well, you understand, I'm sure. There is a further difficulty to exacerbate the problem a composer faces if he or she seeks to write a work with a political message, especially if sung or spoken texts are included. The idiomatic language cannot be too accessible or else it often trivializes the content of the political message. This is the problem I faced when I tried to set to music my prose text for what became The Girl from Buchenwald. I made three separate attempts to set the text to music and each time I failed because the music was either too simplistic and prosaic or too avant-garde and inaccessible for the mass of ordinary people to tolerate. Ultimately, I opted for an idiomatic language that was basically tonal yet not obviously pop music. I deliberately adopted the musical styles of J.S. Bach, a Protestant, and Anton Bruckner, a Roman Catholic, in order to portray the atrocity suffered by Mrs. Steinberg, a Jew, although I never include actual quotes from works by Bach and Bruckner. It succeeds as a political or historical work, although to date it has received very few plays on YouTube, so perhaps my success is purely equivocal. <laughs> 